Good evening, everyone. I am Lisha Dore, president of the Compass Foundation. And this being the first time that I am that I am live for the new year on a social media platform, I would like to wish everybody a happy new year 2023. I know we started off the year a bit rough in Trinidad and Tobago. We have COVID, we have the crime spiking as usual. The food prices are just like hitting the, the top of the roof. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. But I know we are very resilient people. We're strong and we're positive and that strength and positivity and resilience will take us through. So happy new year to you and your families on behalf of myself, my family, and all of us at the Compass Foundation. I would also like to welcome you guys to season two of Critical Conversations. I know season two actually kicked off last week. I was not here because I was a bit under the weather, but um, yeah, so we've made it to season two. Eh? I mean, what started off as just a few friends getting together, you know, as we say in Trinidad, we try a thing. We decided we would just get together online to have a little chit chat. And surprisingly, we ended the year at 33 episodes. So we're very proud of that. I am extremely proud of the fact that we had some amazing discussions with some highly esteemed panelists. I mean, at a personal level, I learned a lot and I would even say that it has been a transformational experience. So we are really excited about season two. I mean, we, we have some hot topics and we're hoping to have some equally hot panelists as we do today. So guys, welcome to season two. Again, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to have you all, right? Now, our topic today is titled Kangaloo versus Khan. And this is sort of like a continuation from the first episode we had last week. And we were very honored to have Senator Jayanti Lachmi Dial with us and political analyst Dr. Vishnu Raghunath, who discussed the performance of the outgoing president, Mrs. Paula May Weeks. And also we touched a little bit on the pros and cons of the two candidates we have for the new president. So we are continuing along the lines of that discussion. This Friday, which would be the 20th of January, we will be electing our new president. The Electoral College will, of course, vote by a secret ballot. And I think most of us would know by now that we have two candidates vying for the position of president. We have the president of the Senate, Mrs. Christine Kangaloo, who was nominated by the government. And in response, we have the opposition who nominated Mr. Israel Khan, senior counsel. Now, if you've been at all, you know, looking at social media, looking at uh, just the newspapers, you'd realize there's so much discussion going on about the presidency. Who's the best candidate? Does the president, the office of the president, does it even make sense for us to have one? Right. In fact, um, I think it's the Guardian, was it this morning? The headlines, it was a big picture of Mr. Khan saying that he's bracing for licks. You know, he's <laughs> expecting a cut ass in his words. You know, he likes to talk very uh, informally and true Trini, Trini style. You know, so according to him, he has no hope at all. You know, the, the, the PNM has the, the vast majority, so he has no hope. Um, I think on the same newspaper front page, the Guardian, there was a small little photo of Mrs. Christine Kangaloo, Kangaloo saying that um, she would make a perfect president, right? There's so many opinions on social media, on traditional media. Some people are saying it's Mr. Khan. Others are saying <laughs> Kangaloo. Others are saying neither. They're both bad choices, you know, and we're hearing other names. We're hearing Julian Lucky. That's a, a, a pretty popular choice for president. Also, Mr. Basse Pandey, who has said he wants to have nothing to do with the office. But anyway, as a moderator, I really do not want to cast any aspersions as to who is the better choice for the president. I would prefer my very qualified esteemed panelists do that, right? And they are far more qualified than I am to give you all an informed opinion. So we do have, and we're very pleased to have with us the former, a former finance minister, Mrs. Karen, Nunes Tushera, who is also an attorney at law, and she really needs no introduction at all. I mean, she's so well known and she's very outspoken on national issues. So we are so pleased that she accepted the invitation to join us tonight. 
And we also have someone who is no stranger to the Campus Foundation. He's been with us from the very start. Mr. Brian Begg, who is a former temporary senator and attorney at law as well, and also someone who is very, very outspoken on national issues. I would like to say a special welcome to you, our viewers, those who have joined us on Zoom, and also those who are connected on Facebook, and those who will, of course, take a look at the program later, which many do. I want to say hello to the media who have been joining us. We are really, we are really appreciating your presence here and also to the other members of the Compass Foundation. And last but not least, my co-moderators, uh, Chris Hussein, our PRO, the PRO of the Compass Foundation, and Ms. Shanta Sipasad. So without further ado, I wanna pass you on to Chris who will kick off our conversation. Yes, I'm very, very excited for tonight's discussion. And indeed it is a conversation that I think our entire country needs to be a part of. And so tonight we have two, I think, spectacular um, panelists to discuss this. And I want to start with you, Mrs. Tashera, immediately, just your immediate thoughts. What are your thoughts on the government's position to nominate Mrs. Ms. Christine Candle? What are your immediate thoughts on that? Um, you know, the, the answer to that question is perhaps more complex than it may first appear. <laughs> because you really have to, yeah, because you have to really be guided by the constitutional provision, because the constitutional provisions will let you know, or should let you know, reflect what was the intention with the regard to the post of president, which is what she is being elected to, or, uh, and will be elected to in the electoral college based on a majority that the government does enjoy. And then you, so the question, why I say it's a difficult question, you know, it's not really, um, I'm not really going into the personalities because I know Christine Gangu personally. I know her husband, Kevin Garcia, both of whom I have, I like very much and I have a lot of respect for. I can't say see about her father, about her father-in-law. <laughs> um, he was, I was unfortunately foisted on me as my campaign manager and one of the, I don't have, a, I don't have the best regard for him, but I can separate clearly as, as I've shown. But the question really is, Will Miss Kanglu, um, having served under Patrick Manning, I was there, she, served, she was there even before me, and having been there, and then being able to make that transition over to um, Dr. Raul, who showed no, there was no question of his personal animus. And I'm gonna be very kind in my language towards Mr. Manning, personal animus towards Mr. Manning. I even told one of his um, co colleagues, one day they said, you know, if the price of admission to the PNM, as it's construed now, is that I have to speak Mr. Manning, I don't think that I can join that party. So that Ms. Kanglu could find herself as part of um, a Rowley government. And a Rowley government, for her own reasons, she would have her own reasons. It means that um, she believes that she can be extremely loyal to him and to him personally and his government. And what does that mean? It means that when it comes to making tough decisions in which she is supposed to exercise either her own judgment or her discretion, um, is, she being, is she going to be able to do that because of the fact that she, there is no separation between herself and the government. She's sitting, she's coming straight off the uh, president of the Senate, straight into that position. There's no gap in between, no no sort of thing. And the, but having said that, so before you go to Mr. Big, having said that, and let me be fair in my assessment, the constitution clearly ref, uh, um, and contemplates the yes. a, a political appointee. There's no question about it. Section 24 says that when the, if the person elected as president is a, a member of the house or Senate, they shall vacate their seat. So clearly sitting then, so it means that you, it contemplates that. Secondly, section 27, when we had the coup, the person who acted for uh, President Noor Asinali when he was abroad, according to section 27, was the president of the Senate, and that was Emmanuel Carter. Thirdly, when there is a, a situation where you're moving, removing a, prime, a, a president who will not resign is for not any good reason, willfully violating the constitution or whatever it is, misbehaving office. When you do that, when you reach the point 
if you ever reach the point, which is very hard to believe you could ever reach her there because you need two thirds of all the members of the house as well as of the Senate to agree to setting up a tribunal. During that period, you know who else? The president of the Senate. So there's no question that the constitution itself almost facilitates, almost contemplates that the person to be president of the, um, of the Republic as head of state and repository of executive power, because that is the head of the executive, would be a political appointee. Um, I don't know, Mr. Big, I don't know, just let me say this um, in order to, and then I will um, give leave, I may mean, not give leave, give way, to <laughs> give, his way. Appoint, to give way to his a point of view, because it would be unfair for me to having said that, because I'm gonna have to recognize that. I have, we must recognize that in our discussion. Yes. Yes. But on the other hand, that same constitution wants a president who's also independent, who's also going to be a gatekeeper, who's also going to be a protector of the people's interests. And why do I say that? At the discretion to appoint nine senators, I'm not going to make a whole bit of difference when they have to make decisions, when you'll be outgunned anyhow, with 16 from the government and nine from opposition. I mean, and then, you know, but yes, can appoint nine independent senators without advice of the prime minister. That is true. Also, too, very, very importantly, with the state of emergency, Section A2 says that whilst you can, she, uh, the president must proclaim the state of emergency, that president is required to put in writing that, that, that declaration that he or she is satisfied that the conditions for, for a state of emergency exist. So it's not just simply you can proclaim. So there's a question of judgment. And we all are familiar with the change of government in 2000 in section um, 76.2, which I guess no one expected we would ever have to use when the then president of um, Ian L. Robinson had to make in his judgment, the, the party that best um, 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 had control or majority support when it was split equally, it was split equally. And then of course I had mentioned you when we spoke um, again, the president has power to revoke the appointment of an opposition, leader of opposition in his judgment. But of course, he looked at the majority position, but best able to command. Why are you using those best able? Why don't you just say who commands the majority? Because you sure. could just take a show of hands. Why? Or secret ballot. Why the words best able to? So you're seeing an exercise of judgment. So there are those examples, and very, very importantly, which is what I'm saying is there attention that you're creating. Very importantly, while the constitution says that the president must act on the advice of the press, of the section 80, I believe, says that the president must act on when, on the advice of the prime, of the prime minister. And any section that says that she must do so, he must do so, must do it. They're not, there's no question of whether they have his question, they must do it. Yeah, that same section 80, and we have an actual example of it. Section 84 says that whether the president consulted or sought the advice of the president, uh, sorry, the prime minister or the prime minister cannot be inquired into in any court of law. And that did happen. The case in way before your time, 1987, with Rebane, when there was a change of government and the then president was Ellis Clark. I think he was a PNM appointed president. Let's get on to brass stats, right? <laughs> and um, he, uh, when he was president, uh, um, president of the Republic, um, there was, of course, there was a change of government and in our government came in. During mm -hmm. that period, he appointed James Alva Bain to two commissions. And Anna Robinson, uh, um, who was prime minister, said, you know, he never consulted with me. So those appointments are invalid. And he went to court. And he went on affidavit and said that he was not consulted. But you know what the court said? The section, either section 70 to 80, I can't remember, it's one of them, says you cannot inquire. So can you imagine if you have a rogue president? Can you imagine if you have a president who says, I, I am doing this and you say, what, I didn't consult with you? Well, how are you going to prove it? You can't take me to court. You can't take me to court. How are you going to prove that I didn't consult? So at the end of the day, my point is this. My point really is that the constitution itself does contemplate a political appointee. But that same constitution wants that 
that political apology to protect your interests and my interests? How would that be achieved when you have a, a political appointee so close, so close to the government? And so I think indebted to the government, I can hardly see that president going against the government in circumstances where it would not be the interest of the people. A state of emergency could be an example. Look at the case with um, Paula May Weeks. Paula May Weeks, I have to mention that. When Paula May Weeks, and you know, a lot of these people I know, that's the unfortunate thing with me, you know? I'm old <laughs> enough to either have taught them or been in school with them. So I don't have the distance that you would have. I don't have that distance. It's a good thing and it's a bad thing because I have views, some of them good, some of them not so good. <laughs> and I can assure you of that. I can, I'm from personal experience. So with the Paula May Weeks, who was a court of appeal judge, when she said, when, she's, when, when that issue came up with the appointment of um, Gary Griffith on the merit list, who was the first on the merit list, and she had previously said that she was a creature of statute and I cannot put anybody to act because I act, act within the four corners of the constitution and the constitution does not give me the power to make any act in appointment. That same um, um, mm -hmm. prime uh, president said that the list was immediately withdrawn. Well, I would love to know what they mean by immediately withdrawn. It could only be withdrawn if it was given to you. And that same constitution does not give you the authority to hand it back. You, the, uh, it says in 123.4, once that merit list is submitted by the Police Service Commission, the president shall prepare the notification to parliament. So at the same time, the prime minister came to visit. He said he did. And he came with a report. Uh, how could you then? I mean, look at that example. That's a classic example of why one has to be very concerned about any person appointed that is so close to the government as Chrissy Gang, who are, by the way, I like personally, but mm -hmm. I don't think it is right. It is not good for the country. So you do not support it or you do support it? I do not support it because if I use Paula May Weeks as an example, and I've asked, and she was a court of appeal judge, but they all just to say that I know, I, know, I <laughs> went to school with her. <laughs> okay, I went, and she was in class with, with Sharon Clark, Clark, Sharon um, Clark Rowley. She's a big Clark, Sharon Clark. She was in class with Sharon Clark and Hazel Thompson. And he, they're all in a group together. They're all friends together. Yes, yes, they were all friends together. That's that's a very interesting yeah. information. Yeah, it was not only interesting. It's true. I was a student there, so you have to understand that um, if the court of appeal judge can do what she did, which is obviously outside of her remit, then much less for Christine Ganglu, who I like, but I am quite confident will have a great deal of difficulty not bowing to the dictates of the prime minister, even where she has the discretion to act in the best interest of the people. I cannot see her doing that. Her father-in-law is Anthony Garcia. Noel mm -hmm. Garcia is her uncle-in-law. She's, I, I cannot see, I cannot see it. And that she was able to make that move, which I could not do from Patrick Manning to Rowley, who had great animus, personal animus towards Patrick Manning, a man who you served under, a man who you served under, that you could make that shift. You are going to do his bidding. And for that reason, I cannot support it because I do not believe that she, if called upon, to exercise the provisions of the constitution that require a certain degree of safeguarding and gatekeeping, I do not believe that she will be capable of doing that. And for that reason, it's, we might as well have an executive president so that we do not pretend and go through this pretense of having a president who has some powers that she can, he or she can exercise. When in fact, when you make political appointments and so close to the so close to the, um, the, the prime ministership, so close to the cabinet, I cannot see that you will do it. And for that reason, it is not something I can support. And it is not personal, definitely not in Uki's. Well, that's some, well, we, we need to un, un, um, unwrap some of what you said there. It's <laughs> very interesting, as you say. But I want to go to Mr. Um, um, Beg. What are your immediate thoughts and, and um, response to Mrs. Teixeira or her sentiments that you just shared? Well, 
first of all, a pleasant good night, Chris, and to members of your panel, a special good night as well to Mr. Shera. It's an honor to be in the same platform with the former Minister of Government, a very senior attorney at law, and I've read some of her books as well. <laughs> yes. I say that, ma'am, it's an honor to be with you here. Um, Thank you. What I would say is that I would tend to agree with Ms. Mr. Shera that such a nomination of Ms. that is of Christine Kangalu should have never been put forward in the first place. We must understand that this is a clear present danger to the democracy, Trinidad and Tobago. It is also a clear and present danger and the run of this great document for the constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Yes, I would agree. Yes, it is in fact that in the constitution, there are ambits within the constitution that says some mom sits in the parliament can be nominated. However, we must take it as it is, in that we have a lady that goes by the name of Christine Kanga, who not only just sat in the pres as Senate president from 2015 to present, as Ms. Tishara said, she is a former minister of government in the Manning administration. She's a former member of parliament. There has been no, no word about her ever leaving the People's National Movement, because how else would she have been nominated as president of the Senate in the first place? Is that she had to be connected and close to the People's National Movement, that being the political leader, because it is the prime minister who ensures and appoints these persons in these positions. It wasn't taken out of a hat. It wasn't by public check. No one they didn't go by public consultations. So it is a fact. And by having her there as now the president, it leads now to question the issue of independence of her sitting in that chair as president. Because many things are going to come to her. And we saw an example of that is the Jawala Rambaran case. Miss uh, Tashera named a very famous case in 1987 when that. You, you, you want to bring an action against the president? Really? And now you, you show what has happened now is that Ms. Kangaloo made a decision on the advice of the, the Minister of Finance. Now, the Prime Minister indicated that she was advised. Well, who advised her? Where is that advice? Was that advice plucked from a tree? Who advised her? No one advised her. That is, in the form of my English lecturers, this is a, that's a rubbish of the highest form to say. <laughs> so I have, I have to say that such nomination ought not to have come forward because it, it, it erodes our democracy. It erodes the issue of independence of the chair of the office of the president. The president has to be taken as a very, high office. It's not just a person to sit there and say they're there to pass bills. No, it's more than that. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we will get more into that while, while it goes on. But okay, to say- would... Sorry, sorry, go ahead. Continue, Brian. I, I will um, ask point. my question after. To finish up the point, it's a nomination that should have never have been made by the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. All right, now, I am hearing the both of you all right, Mr. Begg and Ms. Tish, Mrs. Tishera, and I'm hearing the passion and the conviction in your voice, right? And the sentiment is shared by many that that um, Mrs. Christine Kangaloo is absolutely not suitable to be the next president of Trinidad and Tobago. Now, let me just say, like I always try to bring this this pro make this program as relatable as possible. To the average person on the street, the average man or woman on the street. Why is this presidency, who becomes the next president of Trinidad and Tobago, such a big deal? How is it going to affect the average man or woman on the street whose main concerns are things like COVID, crime, the price Ooh, of price. tomatoes, yes, the price of gas? Why are we making a big deal out of this? 
Mrs. Sashera. I mean, because it's on, I guess, make it a big deal because then we make it a big deal about other things too. This is the point of, in terms of our constitutional arrangements, whether in fact this is the best, you know, when things like this happen or when issues like this come to the fore as they do, it then makes one step back and say, but wait, is this the best thing for the country? As we develop as a country, do we need to really look at this idea of constitutional reform more closely or more seriously? Because countries have done it. I mean, before I came on the show today, I looked at uh, several models of a democratic republic. And when we look at that, we look to see whether or not the model that we have really reflects. Um, and, and in other ways, there are many other failings in the constitution, I suppose, because of the fact that in Trinidad and Tobago, we have a we have a population which is both on ethnicity, um, on religion, on culture, evenly e even in its numbers, if you would like to say. So the issues of the presidency takes on a heightened importance because when the president does act, for example, with a state of emergency, if that would which we have had. We have had states of emergency under this government. When we are put in a situation with a state of emergency, when we have to deal with the appointment of a police service commissioner, which we are still dealing with, up to now that decision has not come, um, has not been resolved. When you are dealing with things like that, they become real to the man in the street because one of our biggest problems today is crime. One of our big, and we still do not have, a, have a, a substantive commission on police. And why is that? Because the president, whose role it was to take that list and prepare the notification to parliament, for parliament to deb debate it, failed to do that. Failed to do what she was, requ she was required. And why was that? Because the prime minister apparently, well, he said he came to see her and he gave her a report. So you can't say that doesn't affect the man in the street. It affects the man in the street because we don't have a commission of police. And every day, whether I'm not giving my views on this forum, I mean, I think the, the, as the, the facts are clear that he's not performing well. We've had about 23 murders already for a year. You can't put all the blame on him, but certainly you are the head of the national security. So if you were doing well, if they had a low level, if they had a low level of crime, I'm sure he'll be quick to take the praise. So you, you can't, you can't, it can't go, it has to cut both ways. When it's not good, you have to take the negative and you take the positive. So what I'm saying is, that the prime president, to a large extent, has put us in this situation where we do not have a substantive prime, um, commission of police. So it's not something that does not affect the man in the street. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, people, I think there's a greater expectation, and I think it's not an accurate one, of what the president under our constitution can do. There's not that much he or she can do. And, but when the circumstances arise, for them to act, they are circumstances that are critical to our constitution, critical to our people. And you cannot have a president, cannot have a president, or you should not have a president who you do not have the confidence that will act independent of the government. And, and I will agree with Mr. Bay, that, that nomination or that selection should never have been made in the first place. It's an insult really to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. It is putting your thumb up and you know, it, you know, it's a sort of, we don't care what you think. That's what we, we can do it and we're going to do it without considering the impact it has on the people of Trinidad and Tobago. If you're talking about a democratic republic, don't you want someone there that all of us can celebrate as, uh, as the president and that people have the confidence even if it is a misplaced confidence, have the confidence that that person, if having to act, would act independently, but we, we already feel that they won't, and we have good reason to feel that they won't. And that's not a good starting point for any president and definitely for our democracy. It is not a good starting point for us. Now, Mrs. Teixeira, um, the prime minister had a press conference to, to treat with us and to officially announce um, the government's position. And he said they looked at two factors, experience and willingness. And he did state <laughs> that the, you laugh, I'm telling you. And the willingness part. <laughs> willing. 
so that you know, that's that. so, <laughs> <laughs> so my question is do you think he asked he really did ask persons number one and they really were unwilling and if it is that they were unwilling why do you think persons of that nature independence um great track record why would they be unwilling to serve as president <laughs> Well, it depends on who you ask, yeah, isn't it? It depends on who you ask. If you, I don't know who you ask, but it depends on who you ask. And one of the reasons why they won't, because I don't know if any prime um, president who has been elected has gotten away from political vil um, public vilification. And um, I'm sure it is going to be visited upon Ms. Kangaloo, because the point of all, which is why having her there as uh, from, the, from the start gate, is not a good idea because even if she were to act independently and make decisions that were her independent judgment, if it is in sync with what the government would want her to do, there would there be the outcry that she is not independent. She's just uh, um, doing what the government wants. She's you know it's, it's not going to be good for her. She's not going to come out of this unscathed. You, you just wait a year or two. See either if she keeps quiet, they will tell her where are you your ghost president. Because that's what they said about Paul. Maybe she got enough legs, she got quiet and stayed in a, in a, in a corner. So, Miss Kangu, get ready. When you're in the Senate, you're in charge. When you're out there as President of the Republic, you have opened up yourself to public criticism. And the public criticism is going to come. Because if you taking that position in the first place, you are allowing yourself to take that position. I mean, I can't tell her she shouldn't have taken it. But and it's not for me to judge the choices that people make. But my goodness, I don't think she should have taken it. She said, I'm <laughs> she, you know why? Because why? if you love your country, if you love your country and you want the best for your country, you already know that's not a good look. That's not a good look. And I doubt very much she will tell her prime minister no to anything. And if she does, she might have lost the position as well. But what's that? He said that she was it. She may have lost the position for president of the Senate as well. But Mr. Big, I, I want to ask you the two factors that he said he was looking for experience and willingness. <laughs> now, when he mentioned experience, he said that, well, she served that it, as she acted as president already. Um, do what do you what are your thoughts on that? That that persons were probably unwilling, or, or you think that he's justified and that she's experienced enough for the job? Just before I answer that question, the other question that was posed to Mr. Shera. Where they mm -hmm. say that you know, how this would affect if the normal man on the street, how this affects them. I share the view of Mr. Shera that this does in fact affect the man on the street. We must first note that Trinidad and Tobago, and again, I, I refer to the constitution, right? The first page of our constitution, it is called the constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. And what makes us a republic is having a president who is our head of state. Further to that, and I agree with the issue of the police commissioner, but we have other bodies in this country that the president fully has to deal with. And if of constituting these bodies, such as our service commissions, which are constitutionally duted by Miss President, and that president has to fill the Public Service Commission, Police Service Commission, Integrity Commission, the Elections and Boundaries Commission, and even the Judicial Legal Service Commission. As an attorney at law, practicing attorney at law, I am a very, very, very scared that my democracy cannot be affected to the JLS. The JLS appoints judges, it appoints magistrates, it appoints persons who operate in our courts. And you can imagine if, our, if we have a puppet president, and I say it with no remorse, if a puppet president is put there, you could imagine who could be put on, on that commission to put who on the bench. And you could imagine what could happen. And that is how dictatorship happened in this country. So that is how the normal man in this country has to see it. We also have this for the Regulated Industries Commission via Section 5 of, of, of the RIC Act. The president appoints those commissioners. And right now we have an issue with issue of rate of, of electricity rates. So now to come to the other point that you're raising now, Chris, could you just say it over again? Issue of experience. Experience and, and willingness. Well, seeing the track record of Miss Kangaloo, 
Where again, I must quote the court had to rule in the actions against Mr. Jawala Rambaran was held to be unlawful and was held against the government. And who paid for that? The taxpayers had to pay for that. And further to that, what experience she has? What experience does she have? She was a government minister. We have no idea what's her track record as minister. She was in tertiary education, I believe. What track record she have? None. She, she has the same track record as that of a backbencher, as far as I'm concerned. No, no I, I, have to pick up, I have to pick up far on that. Huh? I, have to, I have to say that she was the minister of legal affairs and as in the legal, she was the one that brought in the computerization system of the whole registration of births and deaths. And she got an award, not from the government, but she was um, a, a, got an, an award for the work she did in computerizing the whole system as Minister of Legal Affairs. So let, let me be, let's, I have to say that, and she was not <laughs> Minister of Tertiary Affairs. It was um, my good friend Mustafa Abdul Hamid was the Minister of um, Tertiary Affairs, but she did. Well um, did a good job as Minister of Legal Affairs. So well, I, just I, I, I said, but outside of that, what else does she have as a track record? Even as a member of parliament, a track record may not have been that good because she was voted out of, of a seat. Right? So, and, <laughs> so was I. <laughs> and, and then the issue of willingness, issue of willingness. The Prime Minister hit this country, I would say, as six for nine or as people say, he just had Jerry. I consulted this one, I consulted that one. This one wasn't willing. Really, Prime Minister, tell us who you consulted. You can't, as far as I'm concerned, Dr. Raleigh consulted no one. I am not satisfied that answer. Because to say that means that nobody in this country is of the ilk to willing to serve as president, where if a prime minister calls you, who, who is as independent in thought and thinking. I mean, I, I Mr. Shara, I, I, I don't know if you share my view with that, but I, sorry, in the words of my grandmother, that no whole water for me. Okay, I just want to, look, you have, you have the constitution in front of you. I don't have it in front of me, but I just want you to look up that thing. I got me a little concerned about the, when you talk about commissions, because as far as I am aware, the, the appointments to the commissions have inquired of various commission, police service, et cetera, elections and boundaries commission are done on the advice of the prime minister. And Agreed. section, huh? yeah, Agreed. but in section, eight, yes, and section 80 says, this is the constitution, not, not Dr. Rowley. That's, I don't like to, I like to be fair in my discussion. It just says the constitution itself says that when the uh, president is required to act on the advice of the prime minister, the prime president shall act in accordance with cabinet. So it is not always the, the only um, discretion when it comes to commissions that the president has is who is selected as chair. I think that's where she has discretion. But when it comes to the appointment of commission, she has to appoint to commissions on the advice of the prime, prime minister, if I am not mistaken. And one exception to that is the Judicial Legal Service Commission. The Prime Minister appoints the, um, the Chief Justice, the President yeah. appoints the Chief Justice on the advice of the Prime Minister. But when it comes to Judicial Legal Service Commission, it is the, the members of the, I do not believe that it is the President, uh, sorry, I do not believe it is that the, um, I do not believe that the President, um, I may be mistaken, you may be right, and I subject to being corrected on Judicial Legal Service Commission. Um, I am not quite sure who is responsible for the appointment of the members of the Judicial Legal Service Commission. I know it's made up of the Chief Justice, it's made up of a retired former Court of Appeal judge, um, I think four members. But what I do want to say, so we do not mislead your, the, the public, is that all those um, commissions of which you speak, they all say she makes or he makes those appointments as the president on the advice of the prime minister. And it is the constitution, not Dr. Rowley, the constitution that says that where the constitution, unless the constitution otherwise says 
where the president is required to act on the advice of the prime minister, she shall act in accordance with the cabinet. We saw that with section 34, that whole bacchanal with section 34, which was passed um, during a long weekend. And the president said, well, he had no choice. We didn't have a choice. So let's be careful when we uh, uh, arrogate or, or assign to the president far more authority than he or she does have, remembering that the words on the advice of the president, of the prime minister, on the advice of the prime minister, really means that the president has no judgment of her own or his own, or has no discretion of his own. So, you know, that's, let's get that, that, that has I, to be- I, a, I, I understand, I, I totally understand where you're coming from, but I, right. I get I it, I, 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 I always have to say, that our that the president, even though may have to act on the advice, may have to act on what is recommended or suggested yeah. to him or her. If we have a president who mm -hmm. totally comes out of the political bosom of the government, there, there may not be that, that rational idea, that rational thought to say, um, Mr. Prime Minister, you want to rethink this name? Mr. Prime Minister, you want to rethink this? And that may not happen. But, so yeah, but you see, you serious. see, Mr. Big, I, you know, maybe I, um, and I told you from this to get go that I do not support the um, appointment, yes, yes. and I said the reason. So uh, I, but I always try to be fair. So we got if you want to do the blaming, the blaming, we have to go to the constitution, of uh, creating this situation of attention between the office. Because remember, and this is actual learning experience for me. Um, the, um, the head of state is really the head of the executive. That is the commander in chief of the armed forces and head of the executive, repository of executive power. So the only way that the president does not exercise the executive power, which is what the government really does on day to day, is where the constitution so provides. And the constitution makes provision that you will not act Mr. Miss, Madam President or, or Mr. President, if the constitution says that you shall act in, on the advice of the prime minister, because your job really is under mm -hmm. our constitution, as unfortunate as you, we may find it, is that it is really you are to, uh, that is, you are really there to carry out, or not to carry out, that's a strong word, but to be facilitative of the governance of the country through the elected government which is whoever the forms the government of the country yeah. so you and and the fact that section 24 makes express provision for that that section 27 says that when the president is not in the country the president is and it shall act when we deal with so when we deal with even with removal of the prime minister i think she can act on her own judgment the prime minister yeah. that the president does act on her own judgment the fact of the matter is her role or his role is to facilitate uh, a relationship of governance with the government of the day and with um, her position as the repository of executive authority. So the issue really is, has the constitution created this, 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 this tension, this unfortunate situation where the prime, where the constitution seems to be saying, yes, let it be a political appointee. But at the same point in time, you are saying to me, if she did not, that's why the, also, that's why the government has to be careful. If you have a rogue president, suppose you have a rogue president, just like what you were saying, suppose you have a rogue president and the president says to you, I am not taking your advice, you know. I am not taking your advice, you know. And guess what, Mr. Prime Minister? I not only not taking advice, I appointed John and I am going to, you cannot inquire in a court of law whether I took your advice or not. And I'm appointing John. You cannot as a government take a risk of having a rogue president and you cannot take a risk of having a president who is holding you to ransom. So you have to be fair. In, so if we blame anything, it is that the constitution facilitates the abuse of this situation 
by the government and the prime minister. So it comes back to my point in the, at the beginning, they should not do it. It should not be done. She should not take the position. It is not good for the country. It is sending the wrong message to the country and it is not right for a democracy and a, based on a Republican um, system. It is not a good thing. In fact, sure. yeah. in fact, someone says maybe it's time you have a Hindu um, um a Hindu president because the fact of the matter is have we in all these years reflected the diversity of our country? Mr. Sharaf, we would have seen in 2013 where Dr. Rowley came and said that, you know, he's rejecting the nominee of Timothy Hamill Smith to be president. Are we seeing the hypocrisy of Dr. Rowley in play in this scenario where he's choosing his very own Senate president to be president? Please, that, I mean, is that what is your asking answers? <laughs> I mean, he has so many times contradict but then again um our um block mr pandey says the politics has a morality of a soul he's the same one that said that the reason why he could not support the government because of a lack of accountability with um call her who is who is having the country in a situation where there's a lack of accountability by failing to pass the procurement legislation by failing to pass the uh, um, the revenue um, legislation, who is not living up to that same accountability. So I wouldn't spend too much on it. It just says that he, when it is suits him as most politicians are, are guilty of that, he will contradict himself. And that again, it comes down, I mean, we can sit down here and go around in a circle. I think at the end of the day, the constitution allows him to do that. To a large extent, there are provisions in the constitution that seem to encourage or facilitate that. But there are provisions in the constitution that tend to say, no, that's not the right thing. You are there to protect us, Madam President. And it's and we as a country that is as diverse as ours is, is this a good thing to take someone straight from the bowels of the politics and put them in that position? It's not, it's not good. It's not good for the country. It's not the right message for the country. You have a responsibility as a prime minister to even for those who did not elect you. You know, and to do that is almost, and, and, and from my point of view, and I like Christine Gangaloo personally, so it's not personal with me. In fact, this is a case of without favor, not fair, it's without favor. I am saying what I'm saying. But I doubt, with all due respect to Ms. Gangaloo, with all due respect to her, I cannot see that she will ever tell that the Prime Minister no. <laughs> and, and I cannot see it. For the past few weeks, we have been seeing on the newspapers her in-laws, her husband, her in-laws speaking course. that she will make an excellent <laughs> president and whatnot. Even her father-in-law said when he was <laughs> Minister of Education, she never showed bias towards him. Um, she acted fairly and whatnot. Do you think that she can separate herself when it comes to a point in the independent senators? So you are coming out from position of Senate president to president and appointing the senators. Do you, do you think she could separate that judgment call in doing so? I mean, I mean, I just already said to you that I don't have any much regard for Anthony Garcia. He was foisted on me as my campaign manager and it was one of the, not the best experience, so I don't have a high regard for him. And I can say that and it's not a secret. I don't know what he's talking about. She never showed preference in. He was a member of parliament in the low house, she in the Senate. So how, what do you, how that, in terms of her, her, her carrying out her functions, her, unless he was a senator, which he was not, he was a member of parliament and therefore in the lower house and the speaker of the house is the one to whom he can make those statements. So I don't know how he's saying that about the president of the Senate when he was not a senator. And secondly, I like her husband very much, Kevin Garcia. That doesn't mean anything. It's not a question whether you like someone whether they are a nice person, whether they, the fact of the matter, she's too politically, she's too, it's not even connected, it's more than that. I, I cannot see Ms. Kangaloo having the ability with all the p &M that is surrounding her, not only herself, but her, her father-in-law, 
Anthony Garcia, her uncle-in-law, Noel Garcia. I cannot see her. The very fact they selected her or is, tells you they in hangs a tail. And I cannot see her be able to fulfill the obligations of the head of state, which require her to exercise independent judgment and discretion. And I cannot see that. And I also cannot see her, um, as you have used the example of Joala Rambrand, and then more recently, we had the case of Paula May Weeks, who wasn't even in government. She was a part of the judge. I cannot see her doing it. And if she, if I do not feel she can do it, and most people feel she cannot do it, why put her there? Why put yourself there? I'm, I'm telling you, if, she, if two years pass, and hmm. there is not a scandal, and there is not an issue with regard to Ms. Kanglu, and she has to regret taking that position, I will be surprised. Either she's going to be mute, which is a bad thing, or she will not be mute, which will also be a bad thing. Now, last week, we discussed the nature of the constitutionality of a president. We even got into some constitutional reform discussions, and we had political analyst Dr. Bishnu Raghunath and opposition senator um, Jayanti Lakshmidia, and they gave us a nice wealth of information as it pertains to that. Um, Dr. Raghunath indicated and the, the entire discussion from last week actually indicated that our country may need an, uh, somebody like an Israel Khan type of person in the mm -hmm. office of the president, Mrs. Sashera. Um, I see you are, you are already reacting. So my question, well, my, my statement is about um, Mr. Israel Khan, is that he has supported both the government and the opposition. He has also condemned both the government and the opposition. He has also condemned both the prime minister and the opposition leader. So, um, Mr. Big, what are your, your thoughts on the opposition proposing Mr. Khan as their nomination? As, as I, I see absolutely no problem with uh, Mr. Khan, Israel Khan's senior counsel. As a young attorney, um, while doing my in-service and my tutelage, I would go to the court. And I always, I always said I like to be an, I, I always wanted to be an advocate. And it was advised to me, especially as I, I, I do a lot of criminal matters, that I should always one day go into the court and see how Mr. Khan operates. And I was always, I was always amazed of, of how Mr. Khan speaks. Israel Khan, for me, is the embodiment of an independent thought thinking person. And the reason why I say that, and, and you, you, you did lay, lay the groundwork there, is that Israel Khan will, will say it as it is to whoever it is on what other side, or whoever it may be. Israel Khan has also been, senior counsel, sorry, I, I must give him that respect, has also helped in the development of Trinidad and Tobago. This is a man who also was never afraid to push the envelope. As you know, he has one of the most defining cases in law where the use of the Nero suit, as there was an issue of him wearing that in court. And he took that issue and went and, and fought that battle. And he won that battle. Further to that, Israel Khan is Trinidad and Tobago, as far as I'm concerned. Israel Khan is a man of the people. When you listen to him, when you meet with him, when you, you, you don't ever see him very, from, from my dealings with him, not very aloof. He's not, he doesn't distance himself from persons. He has always spoken with, with, with the same tone to a person who may be of, of high challenge, even to those who are maybe deemed as a common man. Mr. Khan and I have spoken on many occasions and we have, all, I've, we have always treated each other with respect. I have, I, I have to say, I, I will say it again, this decision, this nomination, I think is a very good nomination for the development of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Well, Mr. Stashera, um, I have to ask you the same question and please don't hold back because we have an uh, opposition senator and, and, and you know, person here. I, I wanna know your no, team. No, 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 I know. So uh, let's start by this. I, I'm, I already told you I suffer from um, uh, a, 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 a situation where I know nearly all the players. You know oh. that, yes, you know, so 
with regard to Israel, can I know Israel? Sorry, senior counsel. I know him very well. When I say I know him very well, and in fact, when I used to teach at the law school, and I would have um, asked people to come and do guest lectures to me, and I put on a program, I asked uh, Mr. Khan to come, and he would come and do it for me, and he would speak to the students. Yes. I mean, I know I know him on a personal level. Um, just say that I do. I did, I was at Cave Hill with him. He came there as a direct entry student out of Canada. And he was always the same way that he is now. I would say that for him, always a bit of a rebel and always a bit of a controversial character. He hasn't changed. He's the same person from back in the day and back in the day in um, Cave Hill. Um, and there's not been, and he is a brilliant um, criminal lawyer. No question about that. Um, so I have that respect for him as senior counsel. There's no question about that. Um, but suitability, you know, I remember I will use this as a, the best way I can see it. And without, you know, you know, I just, I, I just, the best way I could see it. I remember once when I had now started teaching in the law school, I got the, the office was occupied previously by um, Mr. Noor Hassan Ali, our former president. And they had a function and I was in a line thing. And I said to him, um, Mr. Hassan Ali, what would you say? I don't think he was president anymore. Oh, he was a judge, he had been a judge. He was, I don't think he had been president yet. I think, I don't know what stage he was, but I do know, I asked him, what do you think are the most important qualities for a judge? Judicial temperament. So, that was his answer, and I never, and that's so many years ago, and it stuck with me because he didn't tell me brilliance, he didn't tell me, um, you know, the the kind of um, gravitas in terms of intellectual capital. He never said any of that. He just said one thing to me: judicial temperament, and that stuck with me. And I think for the office of the president, that is also required a certain temperament that. One has to, and I do agree with you, Mr. B. He is a man of the people. He is. He, he, when he came and talked to the students, he told them his father was a taxi driver. Right? He told them that's where he came from. Those were his, begin those were his beginnings. He said, you know, and at first he said that, you know, sometimes in the early days when I would behave in a certain controversial manner, it was because I perhaps I was trying to compensate for my early beginnings. And he was the one who used the Nero jacket. He started the whole control. He became to the front lines of the profession when he challenged the issue of advertising, when he advertised and that set up a whole issue in Trinidad. And that is actually what I think we started the code of ethics. We eventually had our own code of ethics because one of the things that were very strong was advertising. So, mm -hmm. doc, so Mr. Khan has made great contributions to the country. Um, does he have the temperament for the position? I, I am not of that view. And I may, I'm sorry, um, Israel Khan, Israel, I have, you know, sometimes when I say these things, they, I don't, I hope that he doesn't end up having animus towards me because I certainly do not have it to him. In fact, just to tell you how close I thought I was to him, when they had a commission of inquiry, who do you think I went to to be represent me? I went to see Israel Khan. I said, Israel, I need somebody. Well, sorry, you know, Mr. Khan, to your senior counsel. I need someone to represent in the commission of inquiry. So, I mean, I am telling you that this is not somebody, this is somebody who personally likes a gentleman. Does he have the temperament? I don't think so. And, you know, I think he, I know him, I think he, believes that too. I think he, he will be controversial if nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> no, my sister Shara, you said something early on in this interview and we're going to open up the um the well the, the chat now to, to take some questions from the audience. But before we do that, you said that if the price to be a PN uh, to be a part of the PNM now is to bad talk Mr. Patrick Manning. Uh, and, and, and that was something that stood out to me in, in some of your opening statements. And you would have been against the way, and, and you said this in your um, campaign against um, Dr. Rowley in the internal elections, that 
that you didn't like the way he was governing and, and his, you know, and you would have um, criticized him and those things. So of course you would, would have, you would have been a part of the Manning administration. You seem to be against certain decisions that the Rowley led PNM has taken now. Um, contested against Dr. Rowley, he was successful. And, <laughs> yeah. And now we're at a In point- In a man of speaking. <laughs> now we're at a point where you are also against his position and when perhaps maybe his government, the PNM led Dr. Rowley, PNM led position as it pertains to the nomination for the office of president. Yeah. And this is a very controversial question, and I, I, I want to warn you a bit. Will you be resigning from the PNM soon? No, I, no. I, you know, I, no, I don't think I would do that. I think I, it's not that the PNM I have a problem with, is the head. So I don't think that, um, no, that I don't have any intention of doing that. I, I, when I look at people who do that, I always look at them uh, uh, with a jade, a bit of um, a jaundice eye. Because I wonder if their political ambition is what is um, motivating them to move on from one part to the next. I mean, so that is my consideration with that. And I would imagine that people would say, look at her, she didn't get through with her, so she jump in and join you another and party. So it's not the, yeah, so it's not the PNM that the party and what it stands for is like anything. Look at the Republicans with Trump. <laughs> you know how many Republicans do not support um, Donald Trump, but they are Republicans. But if no. I may um, come in here, right? What is the motivation for you staying with the PNM? Because you seem to be in objection to so many of their policies and their current <laughs> leadership. Yes. Um, well, that's a good question. That's a good question to ask. I hope we're not because putting I you think, on the spot yet. No, no, you're not. I don't, our, um, topic of the you, I don't have any cocoa in the sun, you know. That's what someone <laughs> said. That's the problem by, with my being so outspoken, you know. Problem with me being so outspoken is that as far as I'm aware, um, you know, there's nothing that they can... That I am, I'm one of the few people that feel I can speak on behalf of for whatever it is good. So... Yes, I'm not happy with the current PNM. Yes, I'm not happy with the leadership, but I use Trump as a good example. There are a lot of people when Donald Trump was in um, uh, as the head of the Republican Party, they're not happy with him. And they're still not happy with him. That doesn't mean they're going to say they're not going to be Republican because they probably believe in the underlying philosophy of the Republican Party. So I believe in what the PNM stands for. And I believe that a lot of good has been done by the PNM under the on um, this um, leadership, absolutely not. And I am in free to give my views. This is this is still a democracy, and as far as I know, they have not been able to um, find anything because I could sure they must have looked high and low to find something that they can shut me up, and they have not been able to do so. So <laughs> I continue. <laughs> All right, well, I do have one final question I would like to ask. Well, I know, Brian, you said you are in full support of uh, Mr. Israel Khan. So I want to ask Mr. Shera, because Mr. Shera, you, you do not find either candidate suitable. Mm -hmm. Who would have been your pick for president? Well, you know, that was a good question. A name was, I don't want to call the name. A name was called to me. But, you know, when the person called you, and again, it's someone I have a high regard for. Someone I had a high regard for. It's a really tough thing to become the president in this country because I, I I'm, have a lot of difficulty finding someone. But I, I have not I have not cast a net. So maybe if I did cast a net, I would find that someone would come to me. But I could tell you, I do not think Mr. Khan is suitable for the reasons that the temperament that is necessary for the office. I do not think that he, he's suited to that in my respectful opinion maybe prime minister maybe leader of the opposition a very good leader of the opposition if i may say so maybe that is the right maybe that's where he will find his right place but as the head of state not so much and with kangaroo i told you the reason why so you asked me who i could think of one or two people but even with them you know when you've been around as long as i have been and you have been around most of the players unfortunately or on nearly every one of them, unfortunately for me. Whether I served with them, whether I taught them, like Faraz al I taught him, 
Reggie Amor, I went to school with him. I mean, I could just go on and on. Um, Kerwin Garcia was one of my students. He said, he said, was he miss? Um, you know, there's so many of them, even though Garcia was one of my students when I was teaching EMB. So for me, unfortunately for me, I mean, a little too much. And the little too much gives me um, pause in trying to think, who do I have that confidence in? Hmm, I can't think of anybody at the moment. I could tell you, I know, the, I don't think they are the right people for the reasons I've said. Who? Oh, I have real difficulty with that because the unfortunate thing with me is that I know too many of them, too mm. many of them personally, and have a view that may not be one that's suitable to be the head of state. All right. Well, I see we are at 9.05. Maybe Douglas not... Mendez might be a good choice. Maybe mm. Douglas Mendez. Okay. Maybe Douglas Mendez. I, 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 now you think about it. You put me to the test, and that's just off the top of my head. Maybe Douglas Mendez might be a good choice. Okay, well, I said 9.05. Do we have time for a few questions? Yeah? We can probably make a hard stop maybe at 9.15 if that's okay. I'm, I'm okay, you can feel free. You All right, go. so we'll just take a couple of questions um, from the chat here. So the first one here I am seeing. Justice Julian Lucky's name was in a public space. Would your panelists support Justice Lucky? What, what are their thoughts on her? I would support her. I have a lot, would, lot of respect for okay. her. Okay, all right. All right, so Dad Brian, do you have an opinion on that? I have no issue with the name of Julian Lucky. Um, she, was a, a, she, she's, she was an excellent attorney. Um, Yes, she was a former member of parliament under the United National Congress, but that is way back in the past. Um, she has been, a, um, I've listened to a lot of her judicial um, um, pronouncements and it has been really good. I, is, is, that, is that an issue for me? She's a fair person. I also have to have taught her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. But I, I, she's a I fair person. so bad that I have not been taught by Mr. Sheridan. <laughs> That's what I told you. It's hardly a person you can call. And I, and <laughs> I like her so, and I, and I personally like I, I her. And I like her problem. because she is a person of integrity. She is a person of integrity. The, the one thing I will say, and I, maybe Mr. Shera could hear me this as well, before you take another question, um, Misha, is that when we're looking as well, as I believe Chris did talk about the issue of the independent senators, the independent senators plays a major role in passing of our legislation. Having sat in the Senate uh, for a good bit of times, we have seen in the, in the past where our independent senators have, have been able to protect a lot of our constitutional rights by defeating certain bills. An argument that can be raised is that if Ms. Kangalu becomes president and these nine persons are selected by her, there's then that dark cloud that overshadows these nine appointed new senators independent senators, that they may have some form of allegiance to that of the ruling party. And that is dangerous because bills may pass. Like, this is just what been raised. But further to that, what may also point. happen is that the president decides, let's just say, Ms. Ms. Lisha Dory, I, I'm calling upon you, I'd like to appoint you as an independent senator. And she may say, listen, Madam President, I thank you, you know, but listen, I am totally independent. You know, I, I have nothing to do with politics. Next thing I take your this position, they call me a PNM. So ma'am, forget me. You know what happens there? Our, our development of the country is stymied. Even with persons who have to be put into commissions, even if to be up, um, to be recommended by the president. I'm sorry, by the prime minister, right? And the president sees her name and say, um, Chief, here we go. You really want to put Lisha Dore, boy? You know, she, she, she writes a column against her, you know. Um, let, let, me, let me put Karen Nunes to share. I just, just use it as an example, ma'am. <laughs> right? And he say, you say, well, okay, all right, we'll put she. I mean, it, it leaves now to people being not want to serve. It may cause people don't want to get involved. And what happens to Trinan and Tobago? Trinan and Tobago becomes dead stop in the mud. So I don't know if Mr. Sherry would agree with me on that. I think you made a very good point. 
about the issue of the independent senators and her ability to be independent in appointing the independent senators. Because as I said, without calling names, I know a lot of them. <laughs> and I know a lot of them. And I do. And I personally, I'm of the, I am quite confident that some of them, not all, but some of them are not independent. I'm quite well, confident about that. And, and, you know, and I will say the reason I formed that opinion is just for the same things, reason you are saying. Just for the reason you are saying. So imagine you put the president in the Senate and she has to appoint nine independent senators. Okay, so next question. Do you see the government MPs and senators making a conscious vote when the electoral college is summoned? Oh my God. <laughs> Making joke or what? I was going to say, yeah. oh my God. You have to be making joke. You don't see the, you don't see Dr. Ollie has everybody in line. You don't see <laughs> everybody in line inside of there. They only have about three or four of them are talking and the rest of them are mute. Wonder. Listen, this is my opinion and I don't have anything, but again, as I told, I know too many of them. I know too many of them. So the point I would say is this. A lot of them silent because they have to be silent because they have to keep the job. I have a feeling a lot of them do not support a lot of what is happening. But there's a little clique, a powerful little clique uh -huh. around, around the shoe. Mrs. Okay. Sushera, as you mentioned this, I want to ask you, did any government sitting MP senator call you for advice on, on, on anything in the last maybe year, perhaps even on this issue? They wouldn't do that. If I, they would not, first of all, I would not, you know, I know you by finance train, but I know a few of them well. And mm -hmm. I like a lot of, a good few of them a lot too, but I don't think it is fair to put them in a position that they communicate with me because if it came out that they were communicating with me, I don't know that would be good for them. I've seen it happen when I was in government. It's not a good thing. You have to keep, they have to keep their distance. So no, they would not call me. And I wouldn't call me if I were there either. <laughs> <laughs> I would call you. <laughs> no, they, they won't call me. But, because you know what will happen? You heard um, so and so called Tishera. What? She calling Tishera? What's going on here? Mm -mm, they don't do that. And I would I, I would not encourage it either. They will get the buffet in their life. I, buffet, I they're, lucky they just, they're lucky they just get a buffet. Yeah, my well, well, <laughs> well, I just saw one last question I want to ask on the chat here. Someone asked. Do you think Mr. Augustine, the sitting chief secretary, would make a, a good president? I don't think he, I don't think he's earned his stripes as yet. He's still in the day, he's still green. I don't think I can make an assessment of him. Um, he came in there, a lot of people will um, you know, he almost was like a star boy. I've been on a show one on CNC3. Sorry, I'm calling names of stations, but I was on their show when the day of the budget and I was on with him. And the other panelists um, were treating him as if this was what we had a star, a star. And he was very lovely and all of that. But then trying to call him on the phone was an impossibility. And I was not the only one who said that. You could get him. So that wasn't a good look for me. And so um, he's too green, he's too you, new. I can't make that assessment of him. So I would not say yes at all at this point in time. Okay, I think at this point, 9.13, <laughs> we can probably take some closing remarks and wrap up. So Brian, if I may start with you, closing remarks. Well, first of all, again, let me say thank you again for having me. It's always a pleasure being with the Compass Foundation. Let me also say it's an honor and a pleasure again to be with Mr. Shera. My closing comments will be this. If the prime minister, really and truly cares about the democracy of Trinidad and Tobago and mm. cares about the people of Trinidad and Tobago, where he swore an allegiance and swear to uphold this. Mr. Prime Minister, withdraw that name immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I, and Mrs. Teixeira. Any I think I can, um, you know, they say, um, when judges um, agree with the judgment given, so they don't have much more to add on that. So I think he should, should for the reasons that uh, Mr. Biggs said, I really do believe that is the reason he should. 
as unfortunately did that. I don't think Mr. Khan is a good choice either or senior counsel from the reasons I said, but I do think they should not have done that in the case, please. But he has done it and he can't do it. And that's, you know, by the way, you know that the pres president can, res can resign. You know that, don't you? <laughs> right. And you know that the president maybe oh, can be asked to resign, can't she? There you go. Mm -hmm. But anyway, to, uh, to, to say what Mr. Big said, it should, it's not good for the democracy, it's not good for our political system, and the name should not have been put forward in the first place. It's not personal on my part, definitely, but it should not have been put forward. Okay, well, I wanna thank you for that. And um, there's one thing before I um, actually give my final vote of thanks. I do want to say hello and thank all of our regular viewer, viewers for, for tuning in. And I'm seeing Barbara, I'm seeing Calvin, I am seeing Ramtahal, Curtis, AJ, Trinity the Bone, Karina. Guys, thanks so much for joining us. And I know we have our normal crew on Facebook as well, Dolores. I'm, I'm seeing Kyle Ta Taklal thing. Kyle, if you're still there and listening on, thank you for taking an interest in the show. Um, Roshan is there as well as Jermaine. Adam, so guys, thank you. This is our regular crew that is pretty much with us week after week, and we do appreciate that support, right? Um, Brian, Karen, I cannot thank you enough. This was such an enjoyable, invigorating <laughs> conversation. It was so down to it, you know? I mean, I, I must say I really enjoyed it. I, I guess you all could tell because I was smiling through most of it <laughs> while I was sipping my coffee, you know? So I know Brian is as a friend of, I refer to him as a friend of the foundation because he's been with us on many occasions. Karen, I hope we can say the same about you now that you've become a friend of the foundation and you'll be willing to join us again because you know, you're so knowledgeable. And although, you know, this is the first interaction I think we've, we've had with you, maybe, maybe Brian have interacted with you outside mm -hmm. of this forum, but you know, we learned a lot eh? and like I always read your columns and listen to you when I can. You're so knowledgeable and, you know, informational. Um, <clears throat> well, I saw well, somebody Lisa, put their hand up, but I don't Lisa, think we have time for that. Lisha, just yeah. before you finish, just to answer that one you just said, I don't know if Mr. Shera would remember this. In 2008, I would have entered into the parliament in the Senate as an opposition senator at the time. You came in, if I'm not mistaken, I think you came to answer a question um, by one of the independent one of the opposition senators at the time but but, but we didn't have much discourse um, but i that's the only time i would have ever had any close interactions much with mr shera outside of that but i've always read her i, I even read her letter to the editor okay read her teachings uh, she is she is a very brilliant attorney i would say that as well of course, no, but no i, 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 I prefer to say well. this i'm a committed trini if you say that about me You'll be very right. That's what I am. A committed Trinidadian and Tobogonian. That is what I am. And that's why I do the work that I do, come on these shows and do the research because I love my country and I want the best for the Trinidad and Tobago. Excellent. So I guess Chris and Shanta, maybe if you all have any final remarks and then we call it a night. Sean, tell us the, yeah. It was a productive conversation and I would just like to thank Mr. Sharam, Mr. Big for being here. Um, I, I felt so nervous to be honest, to be around Mr. Sharam, but lovely personality. <laughs> and we would love to have you again and we hope to see you at some point in time. Absolutely. I'd be very, very happy to come back. We'll come back again on another topic, maybe crime or whatever. Um, just let me know. I'll be happy to be honored to join you. Yes. I, I think you surpassed, the board panelists, I must say, would have surpassed my expectations of tonight's program. You know, when we set out to do each episode week after week, we are already looking to have an in-depth conversation, a critical conversation um, that goes beyond the surface. And I, I listened intently to when you all had that, um, that I, almost like a debate about the constitutionality of certain positions. And that is what we want out of this in, in season one, we did it, and of course, season two, and I do share and join 
um, with Shanta and Leisha and Zane, and we would love to have you back. I know, Brian, you are, you have become I don't know, <laughs> a compass, but Mrs. Sashera, I do hope that you would come back and absolutely discuss more with us. And absolutely. But with those words said, guys, this would have been the installment of episode two of Kangaloo versus Can. Of course, I don't know what time you are viewing this. It might be live or might be you might have just <laughs> and you're replaying this now. And do join us next week. What, next week, Sunday at 8 p.m. for episode three of Critical Conversations with the Compass Foundation. Thank you. Okay, thank you and good night, everyone. Good night to your viewers. And I had a wonderful time uh, being part of the team and um, contributing. And of course, I'd always be happy to join. Um, it's called the Compass, is it Compass Conversations? The Compass Foundation. There's right, a there we go. conversations with the Compass Foundation. Okay, got it. Okay, we well, good night, the everyone. We social media platforms as well. Okay, good night, everyone. So I will end the live now. Thank you.